Thank you. Um, and we all have to consent. All right. <laughs> Wait, don't have. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we have four of our um, alumni who have agreed to present here today um, about their experiences uh, teaching in the Los Angeles area. And um, we have um, a couple of um, folks from various courses here. We have Dr. Ford's class here, um, and we have and we have uh, people from um, volume 48 of perspectives here and and lots of other folks who are interested in um, learning from you about your careers in teaching. So I'm going to just start with um, and I didn't get the dates from Sergio. So please forgive me um, because I couldn't quite uh, find those dates yet. But so Joanne Madrano. Um, earned her BA with us in 2011, then did all kinds of interesting things, uh, such as teaching abroad, and then came back and earned her master's degree in 2016. She's now at the Applied Technology Center High School. Jeff Evans earned his bachelor's in 2015 and his MA in 2018, and he's at uh, Redmond High School. Sergio Lopez is um, at the Alliance Margaret M. Bloomfield High School. And again, I apologize for not having your dates on here. And Edwin Hurtado um, graduated with his BA in 2018 and then his MA in just last May in 2020. And um, he is now at Bourbon D, um, D um, Day High School. Sorry, I'm totally butchering this here. Thank you so much for being here. And um, Joanne, if you want to start taking it away as the one who um, has lots of experience, you all have lots of experience. And um, if you want to tell us more about your job, how you got it, and what your advice is for, um, for everyone here. Sure. So currently, I teach at, we just abbreviate it, we call it ATC High School in Montebello. Um, my current position, I teach ethnic studies and world history, um, and our focus is very much um, a, a project-based learning school. We're also a pathway school, so I'm actually a part of the architecture, construction, and engineering pathway, a history teacher. That's, yeah, it's been fun, Dr. Player. It's been real fun this year. Um, but this is actually my first year at ATC. Prior to ATC, um, I was working actually with Sergio and Jeff we were all at a uh, Bloomfield together. I was there for four years. So when I was there, I taught AP World, AP US History, regular US History. I was a department head, an induction coach, and I was a part of the ILT. Um, that was a charter school. Uh, that was like really my first professional teaching job when I came and finished my teaching credential. And then before, like Dr. Flager mentioned, when I was kind of getting my bachelor's, finishing my bachelor's, getting my master's. I did leave uh, Cal State LA for a couple of years and I was a communications teacher in China for two years. And then all mixed in, in all those years too, I was also a substitute teacher. Um, in terms of the very different experiences I've had, I've kind of been really fortunate. I've done it all at this point. I've had a district school, worked at a charter, worked abroad, I've done the substitute things. So I've kind of just gotten to see everything and really, if Dr. Flair doesn't mind going to the next slide, in terms of how I got all these jobs and how I was able to do all this, um, I kind of just got lucky. <laughs> I really did in a lot of senses. I, I got really lucky. Um, in terms of hiring though, and the hiring process and my advice to all of you, um, the biggest thing would be to make connections now, if you're in your undergrad, if you're getting a master's. Um, so much of what I was able to accomplish, I accomplished because of the people I met at Cal State LA. Uh, the professors I met, the different students I met. So realistically, big part of the hiring process is just making those connections. Um, when I was at Bloomfield and I was part of the hiring committee, I would reach back out to Dr. Flager and Dr. Chatterjee and ask them, and Jeff would ask too for us, and ask, who do you have who just graduated because we need a new teacher? Um, so really making those connections with your professors, because there's a lot of people like me now who are Cal State LA alum who just want to help other Cal State alum. 
find jobs. And so making those connections made a big deal. Um, in terms of having a really strong resume, uh, when I was part of that hiring committee, a big thing that I saw was just so many people not taking the time of doing really basic things. Um, I don't, Jeff can speak to this too. When we were looking at resumes a couple years ago, we were dying because there was just so many resumes that simple things like spelling errors and grammar errors and you know they didn't have correct information it just it made it so much more difficult for us to find somebody so when you're starting that hiring process really just having a clear consistent resume will make a big difference checking that spelling that grammar making sure you have your recommendations lined up and that they know that they are recommending and your recommender things like that so when they get the call they can prepare to you know give you a really great recommendation uh, that happened a lot. There was people who would put their teacher or the professor as a recommendation and then they never told that professor. And so when I'd call them, they'd just be completely shocked why me, this person from Alliance Marketing and Bloomfield was calling them. So just things like that for your resume would be a big deal. In terms of preparedness, I got that first job at Bloomfield because I was just prepared. Uh, they had me come in for a demo and that was my first demo. It was my first real job interview as a teacher. And they had told me it was a technology high school that I could use Google Slides and Google Docs and all these things. And I kind of just thought in the back of my mind, well, Joanne, what if it doesn't work? What if the technology doesn't work? And so I made copies of everything. And sure enough, the day I showed up to my interview and my demo lesson, nothing worked. Their Wi-Fi was down, their computers weren't working. They were ready to cancel the demo right then and there. But I said, wait, I have everything. I have copies. I have things to do with the kids, this is my backup. And so they were just so amazed that I had thought ahead like that. And I think that a big part of teaching is just being prepared for the many, many obstacles that you're gonna face every single day. Because every day, whether in person or in distance learning this year, something comes up every day, um, no matter what. So just being that kind of prepared makes a big deal. And then in terms of more advice, I would just say collaboration. Like I mentioned, Jeff and Sergio and I worked together before when we were all at Alliance. And I'm not joking. I would say, and they could speak to this too. I would say that pretty much every single day we would walk in together into that school building and we would sit every morning and, and it didn't always have to be collaboration in the sense that we were talking about our content or our lessons, but just making an effort of, of being genuine friends to one another and supporting one another. Um, you can't teach on an island. You can't think going into this that you can do this on your own and that everything's gonna work out and you, you know, you're gonna be so happy to be there in the classroom and you're gonna be on your own half the day. But the, realistically, um, you're working with so many other people on that staff and you have to make attempts to collaborate with one another, to be really open to feedback. Um, that's something too that I would say in your first year of teaching is probably really difficult to understand. Just be open. Uh, you're not gonna have, I'm not gonna say you're not gonna have many great days as your first year of teaching, but there's gonna be a lot of days where it's really, really difficult, which kind of leads me to my highs and lows. Um, realistically, and I don't know if the other teachers here feel the same way, but there's a lot of lows in teaching. Um, especially in distance learning. It's been really, really hard. I know already I'm not going back the rest of the year and it's been really just hard making connections with students, getting to know them, letting them know that I care about them and, and that like I'm there for them. And realistically, even when we're in person, it's been a real big challenge just reminding yourself of the highs. So if you look at the picture I have, that was my old desk at, my, at Alliance. Um, and I have like this huge wall behind me of so many pictures and letters and things that the kids had given me over the years, just because they were my highs. The kids were my highs, the other staff was my highs. And I, I'd love to have it behind me just so I knew like, that's why I'm going to work every day because of all the good stuff. And um, this year, even though I left Alliance, there was so many kids that still reached out to me who shared with me their college acceptance letters, who shared with me like, what college they were going to and offered congratulations and things like that. And it was just such a positive, you know, high to remind myself of every day. Even though I was at a new school, meeting new students, having, you know, building up relationships with new staff members. It was always nice to know that these kids didn't forget me. I didn't forget them. 
they were making an effort to reach out to me and it was just such a great high. And so my biggest advice is hold on to your highs because um, the lows can be really low sometimes and really stressful. When I was an AP teacher and Jeff and Sergio can remember last year, I was out, I was, I was really stressed out. Um, I was doing too many things and it was just, it was a very stressful year last year. Um, and so really just having them, having our other coworkers, having the kids, those are the big highs that you need to remember for sure. Um, last slide, Dr. Plager. And then in terms of best practice, uh, I would say that the biggest thing I was able to get out of Alliance and just working in that charter school and that just quick pace of a charter was really being able to incorporate literacy into my classes. Um, ooh, for pretty much the entire four years, that was really the push we had at that school, incorporating a literacy. And that was like my biggest growth and something that I brought to my new job. And just, they've been so amazed about the things that I can do with, with my social science classes because of the skills I was able to learn at Alliance. So things like having reading templates, supporting uh, close reading for students and text of any questions, really building in comprehension as we're going along is a big thing that I do in my class. Um, another big thing that I've kind of really, really pushed this year, especially because we're in the distance learning model is academic discourse, having my students talk more academically. Um, that's been, through Google Classroom questions. So we can't have normal discussions. We've tried having those Zoom breakouts. It's just not effective. So we kind of went through uh, a trial and error and I, I use Google Classroom questions now. And I have uh, supports and um, sense and stems and rubrics and all these things to, to really reinforce the idea that communication needs to be happening, uh, whether it's verbally or written or you know while they're listening as well. So this unit that I shared, and I can post a link in the chat as well, it's a com complete unit that I just actually, I'm wrapping up tomorrow. Um, in ethnic studies, I think the, I think the standards were barely approved for ethnic studies like last month for the state of California. So this year I've kind of just been going in blind. Um, I really use my background in US history to really ground myself in the big themes I wanna focus on in this class. So I kind of created all the content as I, as I was going this year. And so this past unit that we've been working on is looking at Mexican American history and looking at the idea that inclusivity matters and how how can, and this kind of goes back to what I was doing when I was at Cal State LA, how can you know historical memory and things like that be incorporated into um, remembering what gets remembered. So we looked at things like statues, we looked at things like um, important people, we looked at things like unforgotten unfor stories and things like that. And the kids focusing on project-based learning were able to create uh, class websites and then oral history, we did like an oral history project. So really my best practice would just say, as you're going through and developing your units and your lessons and everything, always thinking in the back of your mind that yes, you're a history teacher, but more importantly, you should be thinking of it as you're an English teacher who teaches with history. Um, having that mindset for all these years has really helped me and really guided me as I've created these things and really supported me when I try to get my students to be, you know, high level achieving people. <laughs> yeah. That's it, Dr. Flager. Thank you so much. Um, so what I'm hoping is that we can um, um, do all the presentations and then have time for Q&A. Um, so thank you so much. Um, let's see, Jeff, um, I think you were, you were next. Is that okay? Can I um, move on to the next slide? Yeah, there, let's we... do it. All right, thank you. Okay, tough act to follow, Joanne. Um, and I apologize, it's a bit echoey in my room when I'm all in here by myself. Um, it's a late night for a teacher, um, but I do extracurricular stuff too, so I've been staying after with the kids. So I do just first want to say that about six years ago when I was doing my undergrad, Dr. Chatterjee was putting together like a teacher's panel like this. 
and tasked me with communicating with the teachers and having them fill out any necessary paperwork and sending them links and all of that stuff. Um, and now I am a teacher on a teacher's panel at Cal State LA. So it's, it feels good to, to have that come all the way around. Um, so I teach at Redmond High School right now, which is in the Seattle area. As Joanne mentioned, I taught with them for a few years down at Bloomfield High School down in Huntington Park. Um, but I just moved back up here and have been teaching here um, since this fall. So currently I teach US history and I teach civics, which civics is for seniors up here. It's the equivalent of, of government. Um, past experience, I was also a sociology teacher, um, national honor society advisor, a cross country coach. And I know that there's the stigma of the history teacher slash coach, but I would argue that cross country and running is the thinking person's sport for deep thinkers. So um, I'm looking to, to break that, that stigma. I was also a substitute teacher and I put K through 12 there only because I'm proud that I made a point to sub every single grade in my sub days and was quickly, it was quickly revealed that I did not, I did not belong in elementary school as my first kindergarten class, we played duck, duck, goose and two kids smashed into each other and double bloody noses. And uh, I said, okay, I'm gonna stick with the older kids. I'm gonna stick with the older kids. But my path um, started it at Cal State LA and everything I have now um, to a large extent is from Cal State LA. So whether that is my job, my friends, um, it's, it all started here at Cal State LA. Um, it led directly to, first of all, my um, subbing job, because uh, Dr. Curran had someone come in that I really liked what he had to say. He was at Alhambra Unified and um, got in touch with him, got my subbing job through there. I also student taught for him. Um, I also got my first full-time job. Um, as Joanne was saying, she would pull from the, the pool of Cal State LA alum. And um, I was one of those people. It actually happened at the, um, the PAT or the Perspectives book launch like four years ago. Um, we saw each other there and Dr. Chatterjee kind of played matchmaker of, oh, you need a teacher? Go see Jeff. Um, and then I pulled in Sergio after that, I've reached back out to, to professors. So Joanne mentioned just connections and it's, it's so true. It's so true. And it, it worked for me. And like I say, my profession, my friends, um, my interests all come from Cal State LA. So I definitely have a lot of, a lot of thanks for that. And it's just really good to see familiar faces, Dr. Flager, Dr. Ford, um, Edwin, Sergio, Joanne. So it, it just feels good to be back in, in the mode, I guess. So you'll see pictures here. Um, the one on top is how it started and the one on bottom is how it's going. So you see that it's all, it's been all digital, all remote, which everyone here is also in that same boat, whether you're a teacher or a student. Now, at the beginning of the, the meeting here, um, some of you weren't in, but I was telling Dr. Flager that now we're in a hybrid situation where I have about 50% of my kids in class and then 50% of them still remote because they had the option to opt to stay remote. So it's been a fun dance of teaching two groups of students at the same time and making it work for both of them when these people are turning and talking or doing small group work. The ones over here are doing 
breakout rooms and popping back with onto my computer, popping back into the in-person kids. So all things that none of us were trained for, um, it's, it's all happening. It's all part of the fun. So um, go ahead and next slide, please, Dr. Flager. Oops, sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Oh, next one, that's Sergio's got. That one? Yes. Okay. So Sorry. a little bit about kind of my style, um, some best practices. I saw that Joanne was presenting on academic literacy and um, so oh, she stole mine, but I was, so I didn't want to, to touch on that, but definitely this aspect. And I really like Joanne talking about teaching ultimately English through through history, because some of us will have these teacher dreams of where you're going to say, okay, read this document and read this document. And then we're going to discuss the differences and debate this or whatnot. And you have this dream of, oh, everyone's going to read it. Everyone's going to understand it. And everyone's going to debate and it's going to be awesome. But that doesn't happen unless you as the teacher put in work, right? Whether it's helping them unlock and understand that text or it is helping them to actually speak in some sort of academic discourse. Um, so I second everything that Joanne said with putting in scaffolding, all of that stuff. So I wanted to look at just a little bit different of things too, um, this student-centered learning critical essential questions and then thematic units. So can you advance the slide please? So talking about critical essential questions, um, I find it's very important to, to have these conceptual essential questions that not only relate to something in a micro way, just into that unit, but in a macro into the overall ribbon of, of history. So for example, in like a resistance and rights type unit, um, we ask the students, how does one resist? How does one achieve liberation? How does one gain civil rights? And one of the, the most fun lessons we do with this, and Joanne has done it um, before, is we look at Nat Turner and we ask, is he a hero or is he a villain? And it's a bit controversial, yes, right? But the kids get so crazy over it um, where they're virtually yelling back and forth across the room. Um, he's a hero because of this. No, he's a villain because of this. Um, but it really just leads us into to that overarching question of, well, how should one resist? How should one gain civil rights then? And it opens up the door to then look at other movements, whether it's East LA blowouts, whether it's the East winds, whether it's Stonewall, whether it is um, LA 92, whether it is Black Lives Matter. Um, so it really opens that door. Okay, well then how does one or should one gain civil rights? And it opens up that to that, that larger theme and it causes students to really think about these things. So instead of like I say, asking these, these smaller questions that relate directly to just the specific as well of what you're studying, asking these larger questions that they can take with them into, into today and throughout everything that you've been studying. And that, so you can see a couple examples here. They had to either do like an in memory of Nat Turner or a wanted for Nat Turner. And as Joanne was talking about, it's still all very literacy heavy. So they read primary sources, um, old newspapers, his um, you know, so-called confessions, et cetera, and they develop 
their argument based on all of these sources and they have to bring it all together into claim-based writing. And you can see there's quite a bit of writing on those examples there. So it's a fun way. I try, try to make like a kind of like a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Like they're having fun, but they don't realize they're realizing they're writing some sort of argument-based writing or claim-based writing, uh, including evidence analysis, all that stuff. So then that kind of leads me into the, the thematic unit. And Joanne and I started this a couple years ago or maybe even last year, I don't know, time, time morphs now. But you will soon realize that you can't cover everything you wanted to cover. Um, you'll get in, you'll be in April and you're realizing that you have just finished covering um, even reconstruction, you're like, okay, well, how am I going to cram over a hundred years into the next six weeks? So Joanne and I started looking at thematic units. Um, and one of the ones that we did was imperialism and American empire unit. And again, talking about those critical essential questions that, that students really need to struggle with and that are just as relevant if you're looking at 1898 with the Philippines as they are when you're looking at right now in the Middle East. So questions such as, does a nation ever have the right or obligation to tell other nations how to live? What is the correct role of the US in foreign affairs? And when, if ever, is war just? And it's these questions that really, really cause the students to hurt their brains, right? And they will, they will ask, me or as, as the teacher, right? Well, what is the right answer? And I said, I don't know, you tell me, what do you think? Right, so it try to make it all very student-centered where they're using these sources, these actual valid, credible sources to come up with an informed decision on how they look at larger things and larger themes in this world, whether it's resistance and rights or it's foreign policy. So part of that unit would include things like looking at US um, involvement, imperialism, annexing, et cetera, of Hawaii, Cuba, the Philippines, Vietnam, Central America, the Middle East, um, and more. And students need to develop an answer to those three essential questions based on what they have read. Did the screen share go away? Yep, it went away and I don't know why because it just said it was paused. So let me try again. It was tired of me talking. No, I apologize. Oh, and I saw Dr. Strolls here too. Yes, oh Gosh, I managed to send her a message via, why is it saying as a security precaution, session ends after 35 minutes of inactivity? Oh, what does that mean? Hmm. Okay. That's me, very um, odd, a new update or something. I don't know. Let me um, find out. So um, keep talking. I'll get the, I'll get it back up. Oh, okay, there. cool. Okay. So then as far as advice, my first piece of advice is get the experience, whatever it is. Um, Sometimes you have what you think you want to do. Oh, I wanna either be at a private school or I wanna be at a public school or I wanna be at a charter school or I don't wanna be at a charter school. Um, and I was in the camp when I first came out of um, the graduate program and the, the teaching credential program that I didn't wanna be in a charter school because I know they're very, very hard on their teachers and they burn teachers out or you just just those random things you hear that aren't necessarily true. Um, but when this job came up, I took it. And it was that experience that then allowed me to kind of get the job that I really wanted where I'm at a, a public school right now up in the Seattle area. Um, because I'm not gonna lie, I crushed the interview only because of the experience that I had. 
right? Because I'd done other interviews where I'm basically going on hearsay, right? Oh, here's how I think I would manage my class, or here's how I think I would sequence a lesson, or here's how I think the procedures, here's how I think I would focus on this certain thing. Um, and as much as I thought I knew, I really didn't. So my advice is to get the experience, right? If you get a job opportunity, take that job opportunity because you will learn more in those, that first month of teaching, right? Than any sort of book or methods class, any of that stuff, right? Those things are important, but when you get in front of the class and you're, you jump in the deep end, the learning, like it's, it's a crash course. So get that experience. And that can be a jumping off point to the job that, that you really dream of, right? If you want to be a career lifelong teacher, go ahead and to the next slide, Dr. Flager, please. Is that it? Sorry. Yep. So there's a few, I, I kind of sequenced them. So go to one more, you can go all of them. There we go. So then also put in the work, and like Joanne said, put in the work in preparing the resume, the interview, but also once you get the job, because you will get the job, um, Cal State LA prepares you very well and they have a very, it's, they have a reputation, right? The history department, the, um, for putting out really good teachers, at least, especially in social sciences, uh, the best, hello. Um, but once you get that job, put in the work, right? Build the foundations with your students, set the culture in your classroom, make those connections. Because if you put in that work in the first two, three weeks, right? Where you are not even opening a book yet for the first two weeks. If you put in that work, that is gonna pay dividends for years and years, not just that the rest of that year, but for years. Um, set high expectations for your students, whether that's in academic skills, whether that is in the way they conduct themselves, whether that is in the way that they talk to each other, right? Set high expectations because they will rise to those or lower to those. There's many, examples of teachers in the same school being like, oh, this student's failing my class and he's never listens and this and that. And then another teacher being like, oh, well, they actually have an A in my class and they're amazing. And it's just because those expectations and that foundation that that teacher set or didn't set, right? Um, so set high expectations and then planning, right? I say, and I feel like one of the professors here said it before, but give your future self a gift, right? So when you're planning, planning lessons, um, units, all of this, really plan it well, really set yourself up so that when it comes back around next year, right, you, you already have a great plan that you're gonna just make better then. Obviously you don't wanna teach that same lesson the exact same way you taught it your first year because that was your first year, but really set yourself up for success in the future. The high highs, the highs are gonna be higher than you think they are and the lows are gonna be lower than you thought they could ever be as Joanne said. Um, those highs, right, where your students get into college, um, where they email you two years later and they tell you that they are majoring in sociology because of you, or they went to this, they're active in this because of you, or you're just in the classroom and students, students get it. And you're standing back and it's a Socratic seminar and it's running by itself. And you're like, oh, um, but then the lows are lower than you could ever think, whether it's a lesson just crashing and burning um, because the internet goes down or it just didn't go as planned or um, just this weekend we had at my school now a, a freshman pass away of cancer. Um, so 
you'll be up here and then you'll be down here all in one day. Um, so find your support system. As Joanne said, you need the support system, whether it's to share those highs or whether it's to commiserate um, because no one can understand teaching except for teachers. So it's tough to go home and complain to a partner or a brother or a sister or a sibling um, because they just don't quite get exactly what you go through. Um, and that's pretty much it. I had some other pictures, but like I say, just get involved. You can see me with students out in front of our door after a door decorating contest. You can see my support system there with Joanne and Sergio um, with other students and just get involved. It's a lot of fun. That's what hopefully these pictures are showing. So do it, do it, do it. All right, thank you. Wow. Awesome. I love the one with you in the, um, is that the Superman outfit? Yes, that was at the beginning. Yeah, yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Thank you so much. We're gonna, we're gonna hold questions and comments uh, um, until the end. Um, Sergio, uh, thank you so much. And will you please remind me when you graduated? Yeah, so um, I graduated, I believe in 2017, like Jeff said, time has morphed. But then I graduated uh, from the credential program where I completed the credential program in 2019. Um, and my presentation is a bit brief here, but I do have, a, I'll make up for it with an interesting story because I did, I finished the uh, credential program in 2019 and I tried really hard uh, after my student teaching, which I did at Bell Gardens High School to try to find a job. I couldn't do it all summer. It was very stressful. And then I decided to pull the trigger on uh, applying for work uh, as an English teacher or communications teacher in China. And this was before we were all really aware of how bad the COVID pandemic was. Uh, so I was actually working on, on getting my visa uh, information, you know, workers visa and all that to get to, uh, to work in China. And talking about, you know, kind of echoing what jo uh, Joanna and Jeff said about connections and about developing relationships. Um, one of the teachers from the credential program, her name was Dr. Joseph, she actually asked uh, a few of us, me and some other students from her class to come back and speak to a new set of students that were just going into student teaching. And I volunteered for that. Uh, and I, when I got there, it turned out that I was the only person that didn't have a, a teaching job. I was barely getting ready to go teach in China. And that was really crushing. But before I left, Dr. Joseph said, you know what, don't worry about it. We're gonna find you a job. And I thought, yeah, okay, whatever, sure. And she looked through her email and found Jeff's email. Hey, we need a teacher. She connected Jeff and I, and then I met with Joanne. We had an interview and then I didn't have to go to China anymore. Uh, the interesting thing is that I got a job, but it was late in the, in the uh, uh, fall semester. So I started working in, I think, October of 2019. Uh, I was finding my footing, uh, talking about relationships. Again, Joanne and Jeff really carried me through uh, all of those months. And then I felt a little bit more comfortable and then we all had to leave in March because we had to start doing distance learning and I haven't been back teaching in person since. So it's been pretty interesting, kind of a wild ride. Uh, I've been kind of flying by the seat of my pants, hence why my presentation here is very uh, brief. I'm looking at what Jeff and Joanne have done and I'm thinking, what the heck am I doing here? But um, I can at least offer that kind of newbie perspective. But uh, basically a lot of what, um, Jeff and Joanne said is absolutely true uh, what Jeff was saying about learning at school if I'm if I'm going to give you guys advice is definitely do the best that you can to uh, you give yourself as many opportunities to learn in person sub sub every grade level when you start teaching really throw yourself into it uh, because if you put yourself in a sink or swim situation you're gonna you're gonna find a way to swim and that's really um, where I was able to actually put a lot of what I learned from the history department at Cal State LA and the credential program uh, at Cal State LA as well into practice and watching it work in person was really what what like uh, cemented that, you know, what, what I was learning in school. Um, so definitely uh, throw yourself into it. But anyway, I'm getting uh, a little bit unorganized here. So yes, I'm a world history teacher right now. Uh, I teach AP world history as well. Um, 
I did do economics and psychology very briefly. I did economics for one semester uh, as well as world history at Bell Gardens High School when I did my student teaching. Um, and like Joanne and Jeff said as well, uh, I didn't know how much literacy uh, we would have to do as history teachers, but it does seem like that's the trend. That's what uh, a lot of schools are looking for now is they're looking for everyone to teach literacy, even math and science teachers have to find a way to teach literacy. So uh, as Joanne said, we definitely do. Um, we, we use the study of history as an opportunity to, to practice literacy, you know, reading, writing skills, but also speaking skills and uh, critical thinking skills. Um, and for me personally, I found that uh, speaking skills have been very important, especially because so many of my students are, their first language was not English. So if you decide you do want to teach in Los Angeles, that's something that you're going to have to prepare for as well. Um, but at the same time, it gives students plenty of opportunity to exhibit and practice skills in different uh, arenas, I guess, in writing, listening, speaking, uh, not just, you know, uh, reading from a textbook and then responding to reading questions. I do have some sample slides and sample handouts from a lesson that I did this week. Uh, when you guys have the, um, oh, Ms. Flager or Dr. Flager, do you have? I think you're muted, sorry. That too, I was gonna try to um, open those links, um, but yeah. I can't do that while I'm sharing the screen. So give okay. me give me a second. Okay. I'll, I'll try to- uh, sure. It's real bare bones stuff. I kind of don't even want you to share after. Joanne and Jeff share this. Yeah. Okay, no, it's not letting me do that. Um, I think I can share my screen. Perfect, yes, please do. So um, one thing uh, uh, we've been trying to do a lot more of is um, focus on skill development. So giving students the opportunity to like uh, read a map or uh, annotate a source. Uh, so one thing that we don't do as often, or I don't do as much anymore, especially because Joanne and Jeff really showed me how to not do it, is talk too much in a class. Uh, I found that if you lecture a lot, especially for high school students, especially if they're 10th grade high school students, it's gonna be very difficult for them to, to, to remain focused. So with that being said, let me share what I have. But uh, this is like a sample of uh, one of the lessons that I gave this week. We just started talking about World War I. So it's pretty bare bones, pretty straightforward. And one of the things that Joanne and Jeff both taught me was how important it is to incorporate visuals into your slides. Uh, as uh, history teachers, I don't think we can get around lecturing. That's something that we're probably going to have to do. Um, but you know, I'm always considerate of the fact that I have a lot of Spanish speakers. So I do my best to incorporate visuals and translate when I can. But at the same time, I don't want to spoon feed my Spanish speaking students too much. I want them to kind of, you know, get the opportunity to also read in English and reply in English. So you, we use an application called Pear Deck where they'll be able to look at a question like this and then respond to it. Um, and for my Spanish speakers, I would encourage them to respond in English. But uh, this is also a really good tool to get students kind of involved in the presentation as opposed to you just talking about it the whole time. And then, you know, as you see, most of my notes are really brief. I try to give them the gist of specific uh, parts of whatever um, event in history we're talking about. And then their, their job is to learn more about it in more detail in the classwork slash homework assignment. But uh, again, I, I want to emphasize how important giving visuals is, especially for students that uh, don't speak English as well as others. Um, so a lot of these notes aren't even really notes. They're more kind of visuals. And I'll talk to them about what's going on in the visuals. But I, again, I also have it in writing. Um, and yeah, and then for homework, uh, again, we try to focus on skills. So one of the things this is it totally, I, I jacked this from Jeff and Joanne, but this annotation key, annotation guide, this is something that we go through at the beginning of class so they know what they have to do. It's always there. Um, you know, we have key terms. So if you look on my slides, all the words that are in red are considered key terms so that students know that I want them to remember these words so that they can better understand the reading assignment, which is also very brief. So then here they would annotate. Uh, and if you, 
look at the annotation key. It's asking you know uh, to define words in bold. So I'll go through and find words that I think they would need to understand or they might not understand immediately. And they would define it here. And then each paragraph or section, they would paraphrase. And then, uh, so I usually inco incorporate either a primary or secondary source to expand on what I talked about in class to give them the information two different ways. And then I give them the opportunity to practice a skill. So in this case, they were practicing reading uh, a map. And the, you know, uh, I would facilitate that, that, that uh, practice by giving them very specific questions related to the map. Uh, and in class before, uh, in prior classes, we've, we, we analyzed maps as a group. So I don't just drop it on them out of nowhere. We practice it together. Uh, and then I give them the opportunity to practice it on their own. And then I also have the assignment in Spanish as well, uh, just in case, because I really, you know, I have a, a lot of Spanish speaking students. Uh, but that's, that's kind of, it's been kind of like the routine. I did try uh, something different, like what Joanne was saying about doing questions in Google Classroom. And that ended up being really awesome to see students actually um, speaking to one another, as opposed to like speaking just to me, because a lot of them are going to be really shy to unmute themselves. Um, but uh, yeah, and going back to the, uh, the presentation slide that I had, I think in terms of advice, I'm just gonna echo with what uh, Joanne and Jeff said about you know, really building relationships, not only with your students, which is very important. One of our assistant principals talks all the time about how students don't do work. They do work because they like the, their teacher. Uh, I think that's very true. I think if you really do the work to develop relationships with your students um, and to really show them that you're there to be like on their side and help them, you know, learn something useful uh, while you're also challenging them and motivating them to uh, rise to that challenge, uh, nine times out of 10, you're going to see them surprise you. Um, and then also developing relationships with your teachers at Cal State LA, with your teachers in the credential program. Uh, when you get there, if you're not there already, and then especially with uh, your coworkers. Uh, luckily, I've had two really strong mentors that I consider my friends now. That even now, though we're not working in the same uh, school, I can always reach out and say, uh, you know, what am I doing wrong here? Can you help me out? And they're very quick to, you know, offer that support. So, like Jeff said, uh, teaching is going to be one of those things where not everyone is really going to understand. I try to talk to my friends about it, and they just go, ah, just give them all B's and then move on. And then I think, no, uh, you're missing the point, man. But uh, definitely that support system is gonna be super beneficial. And the highs in my very short experience have always outweighed the lows. And sometimes I think we need to take a step back as teachers to, to really see all the good that we're doing because you can have a room full of like 28 great students that are just, they're showing up every day, they're participating. Uh, and then there's that one student, and Jeff pointed this out to me, that I would focus on that one student that just didn't want to try or, you know what I mean? Uh, it's always important to, to do the best that you can for all your students, but there are a lot of highs. Uh, if there weren't, I don't think any of us would be doing this. But um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm excited for you guys to start your, your uh, careers and get through with the program and, and just, you know, uh, jump in head first and you're all going to do just fine. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And Sergio, um, I honestly had no idea uh, that you were this new at teaching. Otherwise, I would have never bothered you when I sent you students to observe you and you opened your classroom. Uh, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. That was amazing and awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll, we'll get back to that one. Um, Edwin, take it away. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Edwin Hurtado. I'm actually probably the, the youngest, I guess, uh, or the newest, I would say, in uh, the field. I currently teach at uh, Verbum Day High School. Uh, the school's in Watts. If you've ever driven down Central, um, you've probably driven by um, Verbum Day. It has a nice big cross in the front. Um, my current position, I teach world history. I have uh, four classes of world history, um, past experiences. Um, this is my first teaching job, right? But you know, my most of my experiences come from the things I did 
um, while I was in uh, the grad program, while I was working towards my BA, um, you know, just taking advantage of different opportunities such as peer mentoring and being a grad assistant, these little things, um, you know, they, they, they've been helpful, right? Even though I, I haven't been in the classroom, I don't even have a teaching credential, but you know, the little things that I would see, you know, the professors do in their class, Dr. Flager, you know, Dr. Foss, I'd be like, okay, I have their stuff, you know, I have my little file and, you know, I just look back, I'm like, all right, what, what can I do, right? So those experiences, you know, and uh, they've, they've really helped, um, especially uh, when writing my cover letter and um, resume, you know, like uh, they, Joanna said earlier, you know, it's connecting those experiences, especially to, um, um, you know, the keywords in the job description, right? And you want to sort of, you know, put that on there. So how did I get my job? I just applied everywhere. Um, you know, I graduated, all right, we didn't have a ceremony. So, all right, I better start looking for work, right? So I went on Monster, Indeed. I just went looking everywhere, applying to all kinds of jobs. And, um, you know, another good thing is, you know, check out district websites, see their job listings. And in my case, uh, you know, a, went to the website, the Archdiocese of LA, and they have, uh, you know, all kinds of positions for all the schools in uh, their Archdiocese. You know, look up your public, uh, your local public charter schools, private schools, see what's around, right? Um, I, I didn't even know this school was really an option for me to apply until it was right there. And, you know, like my grandparents live like super close, but um, that's super cool. But um, once again, back to that cover letter, right? Think of this cover letter as your elevator pitch, right? You're, you're trying to convince, you know, the people that are, are looking for a hire, why should they hire you? And once again, you know, can, you want to leverage, you know, I guess in a way, appeal to the biases of, of your interviewer, right? And you could kind of assume their biases by, you know, the language that's used in, um, you know, the job listing. Right, if they talk about you know need to manage you know diverse um, you know student body, talk about how your experiences apply in that kind of situation, right? So you know just once again make those connections, right? As historians, we've been we we sort of that's our thing, right? Making these connections between sources. So that's one way we could apply that, you know, also when looking um, for a job. So how, how's it like teaching at an all boys Jesuit high school? Um, I don't have much to compare it against, but so far so good, right? It was kind of scary at first because it's like, all right, Edwin, you got the job. Uh, we're teaching, in a, you know, like in a couple weeks, here's a couple standards, uh, go figure it out, right? So I'm like, oh my God, okay. Um, let me put together, you know, let me figure something out. And um, it's been really helpful because uh, I have a, a, a teaching coach that comes to my class and, you know, we debrief on what I'm doing. They provide advice. They look over, you know, lesson plans, a lot of feedback. Um, very fortunate that, you know, our principal and admin staff are once again, extremely supportive. And, you know, they're, they, you know, covered costs to go like to, um, I'm going to a conference, right? obviously online, but the school's gonna pay for it. So that's awesome, right? Try to take advantage of the different things um, that your school will offer you, right? Um, I'm not very religious, right? Um, but I find it, I sort of appreciate sort of, I guess, this environment in, you know, that in this school, right? I, I grew up, you know, public school my whole life. And, you know, if one positive thing I can say is, you know, the, the that um you know the liturgies and the little sermons and stuff they 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 provide a positive message for the boys right we're in Watts the neighborhood's rough you know we're all rough but you know it's it's a good way to build brotherhood and and you know just to sort of build grit right that's what we try to build in the kids right like we, we got to hang in there together right and and help out your fellow brother and, you know, it's a positive message that we, I didn't have growing up really, you know, in uh, LAUSD. Um, I like the class sizes. My smallest class is 18. The biggest one is 27. 
So it gives me really time to like really know my students one on one, you know, build relationships with parents as well. You know, remember teaching is, is not a solo effort, right? It's a, it's a community, right? It's you, the rest of your school, the parents, right? And together you're a team to help, you know, um, help the student achieve, you know, um, his uh, scholastic goals, if he wants to go to college and, and stuff like that. So remember, you're, you're not alone. And um, I guess, like I said earlier, um, I have a, a ton of control over the curricul uh, curriculum, which is, I, I guess it's good, but I guess it's bad too, because it's like, I'm, I'm kind of going in blind, not blind, but um, I guess kind of like what Jeff said, he had this vision of what a class is. And I guess I was sort of guilty of that, right? I went into class and I had, I guess, expectations, right? Of what a, a student, uh, I guess, should be capable of doing or handling. And once you get the, what, what I call the data, right? The feedback, you realize, holy, you know, ho ho like, oh my God, like, you know, I had to, we got to do something different, right? So you use this information to sort of guide and inform what you're going to do the next day. Right, so I guess an example was um, we read a passage of um, the Florentine Codex. So it was a passage and it was about uh, Hernan Cortez coming to, to, to Mexico. And we, we read this passage and you know they had the, the boys answer questions and I, I see their responses and due to the responses they gave, you know, it was evident that a lot of them didn't really understand what the passage was saying, right? So next, next, next day I showed up to class. I was like, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna go over this, the source again, right? But this time, you know, we're gonna go one paragraph at a time. And I want you to like highlight, like what is the important de de detail in this paragraph? Because what I've noticed or what you'll probably notice is some of these students summarizing to them is literally rewriting every sentence that they read, right? So once again, it's, um, you know, we've been talking about skills and, and these English skills through history and, and it's very true, right? And, you know, I, sometimes I get pushed back from the boys like, like Mr. Mr. H, why do, why do I gotta read? And I was like, what do you mean why you gotta read? Like, you know, you gotta read because, you know, that's how you're gonna become a better writer, a better thinker. And you know, I just bring up the case of, you know, was it January 6th, right? You don't want to be that 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 num that that knucklehead, you know, invading the Capitol over a conspiracy theory you read on the internet, right? So we got to practice these skills right here so you know how to deal with that content in the outside world. Um, the good and the bad. So I guess these are just personal goods and bads. You know, I've only been here. Uh, almost a year, um, but the highs of the job, it's like, you know, when you're grading work and you see like thoughtful responses from students and, you know, they, they start articulating, um, you know, uh, the information in a way that you probably didn't even, I was, you know, you never saw it that way either, right? So, you know, that you learn as well through your students. Another good is seeing the improvement in their work. Right, so we've been working on um, how to properly, um, you know, cite a source in, in your, your work, in your writing, right? And I saw a, a common error was the student would literally just drop the quote and that was it, right? So then we started working on, you know, we got to have this introductory phrase, then you put the quote, and then, you know, we got to provide some commentary. And, you know, we're grinding at that and you see the kids, their work is slowly, it, it gets better, right? And that's, those are those victories that you take home. Because um, when we're done, when I was done with the first semester, I was thinking like, is any of this getting to, to their heads? Any of this working? But you start noticing this stuff and the work they turn in, or even in the, the comments that the students, um, they give, right? So after my first semester, I had a, um, I did an anonymous sort of end of the semester um, survey. You know, a couple questions like, oh, like what, what activities you felt helped you the most? Uh, but the question I, I, I guess my question for me was like, how has your, 
has your perspective about history changed, you know, so far in this class? You'll get the comments, some comments like, oh, no, history is so boring. But then you get these other comments. They're like, oh, my God, like, um, I don't like history, but now I think I like it. Or, you know, now I'm thinking history is, is more important. And, you know, you get these little comments and it's like, you know, once again, those are those, those good, the, you know, the, the, those highs, right? And um, once again, interacting with students is, is, is very, um, another high. I've, I've had minor interactions, you know, when I go on campus and I'm watching over some, some students, but they were like, hey, is that Mr. Hurtado? Hey, what's up? You know, and it's those, those, those um, relationships you build. Right, and, and it's just like um, the other presenters mentioned, these relationships impact, you know, work, right? If, if, if you guys have a crappy relationship, um, why would, you know, that, that, that student is, for, you know, for, for good or for bad, not gonna want to put in effort or work for your class. It'd be like, oh, screw that teacher, right? Um, job lows, my current lows, the things I, I don't like, I guess currently, or I don't like, but you know, um, you know, Chase, I guess working with, you know, going after students over missing work, you know, I, I know it's a pandemic, but I always, you know, it's trying to motivate them. You know, that's one of the things is just trying to motivate them, trying to figure out what's their thing, what makes them tick. And, um, you know, just figuring that out and um, calling parents. I, I never like to call parents and talk bad about my students, but I guess um, sometimes it's part of the job. Uh, hey, you know, your student was absent or, you know, missing some work. Um, I don't want them to get an incomplete or fail my class, you know? And parents appreciate that kind of stuff, right? That there's other people out there concerned about, you know, their kid, right? And um, sometimes, you know, the kids ain't having it themselves. You know, they'll, they'll get an assignment and they just throw up words on it and turn that in, right? And, and I'll, I'll be grading and like, I feel something fry or like my brain will feel a little weird. But, you know, understandably, you got to set once, uh, as Jeff said, you got to set the tone, right? And the tone is, I don't accept crap, right? So please uh, redo this and turn it in. So, um, I guess uh, final, uh, was it advice? Um, I guess um, you gotta know when to stop working, right? Cause there's always something to do, right? There's, there's grading, emails, lesson planning, um, you know, looking up for, you know, um, sources, you know, activities and, and whatnot. You, you would never stop working. And one of the biggest reasons why people don't last in the field is because people get burnt out, right? And we need people to stay here long-term, right? So one of the things to keep in mind is set a schedule, keep to that schedule. And once it's like, you know, we all have different, you know, breaking points, but an example, once it's seven or eight, and that's your, your allotted time in the afternoon or in, at, in the evening, turn that computer off right? Uh, personal care, because um, once again, we're, 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 we're here for the, well, if you end up liking the job, right, you're here for the long run, right? And we would like you to stay here and uh, teach. Um, I don't remember what else I put on that slide, but. Um, <laughs> I think, that was, um, I think the, the, the last part was, um, miss, you know, the, the missing assignments. Um, I think we, we got it. Um, All right. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, Michaela, do you want to make the announcement before I definitely forget to? Yes. So thank you for everyone that came to this workshop. And as a thank you for students that came, uh, we have a Amazon gift card giveaway. And we did a random randomizer um, as the presentations were going on. So our two winners is, if I mispronounce names, I'm really apologize, but our winners are Harrison Lamb and Giselle Sanchez. If you guys can private message me um, your email, your school email and your CIN, we're gonna make sure you guys get your $25 Amazon gift cards, okay? 
Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Michaela, for doing this. Congratulations to our two winners. And of course, thank you to our presenters. And uh, I don't want to, uh, I'm just going to be quiet and give everyone a chance to, um, to either post a question in chat or just unmute yourself and, and speak. Hi, um, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Uh, I just want to thank you guys who presented. Um, it was really great hearing this. I, I haven't had like the best semester um, and I'm at the tail end of graduating um, next month. And I've been gaining all this anxiety about like, what's it gonna be like to get into the teaching field and hearing your guys' experience and hearing, you know, some of you guys that have been doing it for a while and especially the, the newer teachers it, it was great to hear that like you know it's definitely like a confidence booster and like okay i could do this too so thank you guys for presenting and thanks for holding this too awesome you're gonna be great ruben i know you are i was just gonna second that ruben i i know you're gonna be fantastic so and Ruben also just uh, his article on um, in perspectives is coming out. He wrote about the change of the Kelsey LA mascot from the Diablo to the Golden Eagle. So um, and, and and Jeff and Joanne know all about perspectives and, and Edwin, of course. So you're in a good club here. Yeah. And congrats on uh, graduating, Ruben. Thank you. I have one question if um, if students if uh, students are reluctant to ask I'll I'll start us off. Um, I was wondering if uh, one of the presenters could just be sort of brutally honest and tell us one of those moments where uh, a lesson just failed. And you know I ask this because as a teacher I've I've done it myself. Um, and you know what did you how did you cope and how did you try to turn it around or salvage you know some something that you know part of it didn't work. What did you do um, to fix it? And part of the reason I, I asked this question is so that everyone knows that um, things don't always go right, but that doesn't mean that they go horribly wrong, right? Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, I was just looking, I have my drive of all my years of my lessons because I like to go back and take things. And I was looking today at some reconstruction work before you and Jeff and I used to co-plan together when we were teaching together. And it was before Jeff and I started working together. And I just thought like, Joanne, what the heck were you thinking with this lesson? This doesn't make sense. I'm sure the kids didn't understand this. These questions are so confusing. None of the links are working. Like, what was I doing with this? Um, so I know that it's realistically, as you progress in the teaching profession, like you're gonna get better, whether you realize it or not, like the unit that I have as a sample for you guys, that's after many, many years of just perfecting different things and incorporating things. If Jeff looks at the unit, he'll see certain things that we made together, um, things that I've made on my own that you know I've made better over the years. So speaking to just the idea that the first couple of years are gonna be tough. And I would say that nine times out of 10, the kids like don't realize you're making the mistakes. And also like, even when you do make a mistake, because I made a mistake last week with one of my world history classes, they're just so like, don't worry, miss, it's okay. It's okay. That's like, it's a redo. We'll do it again tomorrow. Um, so more than likely, your kids are going to be more, um, you're going to be harder on yourself than the kids are ever going to be hard on you. Um, and even the administration, they don't always understand that you're still learning, you're still growing. Um, it's always, you have to take a step back. I think like, uh, Sergio was saying, take a step back and kind of just remind yourself that you're doing the best you can. Thank you. And, Thank you so much. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like everyone's saying all about relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to go off of Joanne as well, you know, you are teaching them history, but you're also just teaching them life, right? So to show them how you react to a lesson just completely crashing and burning. So for example, everything was supposed to be internet-based. It was, they were gonna follow um, hyperlinks. You were gonna, you know, show a quick clip of whatever and it was all internet-based and 
the entire school internet went down. Um, the students are always watching you and the lesson that you can teach them in that moment is, hey, this, none of this went as planned. How am I gonna react? Am I gonna like get mad? Am I gonna blame the school? Am I just gonna stop everything and say, all right, kids, looks like we're not doing anything today. Everything's screwed up. Or are you gonna pivot and not even necessarily try to hide it? Be like, hey guys, nothing I planned is gonna work, but you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna make the best out of it. Here's what we're gonna do. Um, I want this, you guys doing this, you guys doing this, let's, let's have a little fun with it today. Um, so just the lesson in general, how do, how do you as an adult and how someone who they, they are looking up to is modeling behavior, how do you react to something not going right? because um, they may not always have that adult in their life that, that reacts in, in maybe a way that you should. Um, so just kind of teaching them that I think is important as well. Yeah, and if I may just piggyback on what uh, Joanne and Jeff were saying, um, I'm thinking of you, Ruben, because I, I still get like knots in my stomach, man, before I have to give a class. And like Joanne and I both graduated from the same high school at the same year, but she has so many more years of experience because I held back. I thought I'm not ready because uh, I was so worried about messing up. And I'm at that point where I feel like all of my lessons are, they're just terrible. And I need, like, I can't help but feel like I need to do this better. I need to do that, that better, especially for like AP world history. Cause I just took it on, I think like in October. Um, but for me, there's really no better way to learn than to make those mistakes. So uh, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice by trying to avoid making mistakes. Uh, I think what Jeff was saying is 100% true. You can you model uh, how to handle making a mistake for your students, but don't let yourself uh, don't don't you know uh, remove that opportunity to learn from that mistake from you. Uh, that's why I'm saying you got to just jump into it. And uh, you know when you do put yourself in a sink or swim situation, you're going to swim. So, yeah. A small comment, just take solace that whatever you teach the kids, it's, it's pretty new, right? So even if, if, you know, you weren't able to hit, you know, 100, 80, even 75% of, of what you wanted to do, what, you know, what you were able to hit at the moment was something relatively new and, and you know, um, you know, something to add to, you know, their historical education, you know, working on the skills and all that. So, you know, even if it's not 100%, there, there's still growth happening. And, you know, just take comfort in that. And, you know, like we said, you know, after the class, go back to the drawing board and, and figure out how to do it better, right? And that's just, you know, I hopefully reach, uh, hopefully would, you know, I'll reach at the level of uh, Joanne and, and, and Jeff. Thank you. Um, we have um, Adrian. Hi, Adrian. Good to see you. Uh, we have Adrian asking uh, the question of what is the biggest or most important difference with working uh, with middle or high school age children? Um, he's not quite sure yet at what level he wants to teach. Uh, can any of you speak to that difference between middle school and high school? Well, I did my student teaching in middle school and it went okay. It's just, it's, it's different. It's very, very different. When I got my job at Alliance, I was the junior history teacher. And I loved it. And I would tell my principal every year, don't move me. Like, don't make me the seniors. Don't make me the freshmen. I want to stay with the juniors. And when I left Bloomfield this year and I ended up in Montebello, I got freshmen. And it was something, I had talked to Jeff and Sergio about this. It was something that I was dreading. Um, I just had it in my mind that freshmen are immature and they're difficult to work with. And like them, like I've always set high expectations. I was the AP teacher. I was all these things. The kids, I had built up a reputa reputation, so the kids kind of knew me by the time they were juniors. When I left all of that and I had to start from scratch, it's kind of been a crazy year. I've never even met the staff at my new school. I've never met staff. I've never met students. I've just been completely virtual this entire year. Um, so when I started out, it was it did take some time. But what I've learned is that I kind of love freshmen, and I kind of love that you know, that middle school age, because um, to me, ninth graders are still kind of middle school age. Um, I've kind of loved their perspectives and they're just, they're more willing to participate and they're more willing to share. And 
they're not as sensitive to um, the teenage drama yet. So it's been kind of fun this year, getting a completely new experience. And I just had to talk to my principal about my uh, role next year. And I kind of said, keep me where I'm at. I don't, I don't know if I want to go back to the high paced, you know, reality of juniors, because juniors and seniors, it's all about college and it's SATs and it's all these things. So, I mean, speaking to your question, I would say, give yourself an opportunity to, to just go with the flow and see what comes of it, because you're going to be happy wherever you're at. And the good thing too, Adrian, is that with middle and high school, if you have a single subject credential, in most cases you can teach both. So you don't need to decide you know, where you need a multiple subject credential to teach elementary. And if you have your single subject, it's no go. So if you are weighing those options, try them both out, either subbing um, or, or even when you get into the profession. So I think it just, it'll speak to you when you experience both. Um, and, and you'll realize, oh, I really like these younger kids because like Joanne said, maybe there's less ego and they're like eager and it's fun. Um, or maybe with the older kids, you're like, I really like the complex conversations that we can have and like the, the critical um, and, and intense topics that we can discuss in an academic way that you wouldn't maybe be able to get to with those middle school kids. But try each out and something will speak to you. And like I say, with that single subject credential, luckily you can, you can do both. So you're not um, painting yourself into a corner. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to jump in for a minute and say, um, I can't tell you how gratifying this has been for me to see former students and to see just what fantastic teachers you are and how and and, and how much the, um, I guess the relationships with Cal State matter. And I think, you know, sometimes even though I think about that when I'm in the classroom all the time, I when when you all leave, sometimes I don't know that it's still making a difference in your life. And so I think to everybody, um, you know, students and teachers in this forum, um, relationships, relationships, right? And so thank you, everybody who came to present. And um, it really was so gratifying for me to see that, you know, that what we do at Cal State makes a difference, just like everything that these teachers are doing makes a difference in all of their students' lives. So um, really inspirational for me. And I hope that um, it was for all of the attendees. And I, I'm really, really grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, sorry, I had a question also. Um, I noticed that many of you did sub work before you did a uh, teaching the job and that's what I'm also doing right now, but summertime is coming. And I'm just kind of wondering what you guys did over the summer or if you have any like job recommendations that I can maybe look into. And then also if you have any more like advice over the interview process um, to when you're applying to teaching positions because I have like a lot of anxiety around that. like if there's um, any like documents that you had ready, like test scores or anything like that, how many lessons do they tell you, which, you know, sample lesson you have to do, or do you get to pick from your own, like, you know, stash of lessons, so, yeah. Well, in jobs over this summer, um, I don't work over the summer. That's like my one time over the year where I purposely will tell whoever my boss is, I don't want summer school, I don't want to do anything. Um, but then I always end up doing something anyways. So I, I don't know if I, I can help you with the summer job hunt. Um, but in terms of just interviewing, uh, something that I've, I've talked to before with the people who interviewed me for the Bloomfield job and even for my current position, is they kind of said that my demeanor was one where like, it didn't seem like I cared if I wanted the job or not. I tried to be as calm as I could. I, tr I tried to like just go into it with the with the best, you know, positive attitude as I could be. And they, at least when I was doing the hiring, like for Jeff and for Sergio and the other people I hired, um, I did always give them the choice of bringing in whatever lesson they wanted. I would let them know if I was allowed to let them know, cause that's kind of always iffy, to let them know what the position was for. Um, so like for Jeff, 
at that point, I don't think we knew what his position was for. So we kind of just said, social science, any kind of lesson you want to bring in, be prepared with these things. Most, most schools will let you know those things ahead of time and kind of just give you, they want you to succeed. Believe me, they want you to have the job because they don't want to keep looking for people. So realistically, Sergio laughing, but it's true. Like I, I called Sergio and I said, look, this is what we're looking for. This is the kind of lesson you should be doing. Um, be prepared and be ready because I don't want to keep looking for somebody for this job. Um, and realistically, I think that because of this pandemic, because of distance learning this year, there's going to be a lot of people who are retiring who no longer want to be in the teaching profession. And there's going to be a lot of more open positions in the next year or two. Thank you for that encouragement. Um, we um, have to wrap it up because we have these other classes that are about to start. Um, thank you again so very much. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I am posting your Google Slides um, with your permission on Canvas and also on the File for Theta um, site as well as eventually Perspectives. Um, so that you can go back to that and um, you may be getting more emails um, <laughs> than, than uh, you can handle. But um, you know, I think we can um, thank you for being this incredible resource. And um, thank you, Sergio, for posting your, your email here as well. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, this, this is so important for us, as Dr. Ford already said, um, to, to hear. Um, when when things worked at Cal State LA, um, and you're always welcome to set, say, what else can we do to prepare teachers? Yeah. Okay, maybe that's another uh, message you eventually can send to us to let us know what we can do to to help everyone here to um, to succeed uh, in in their careers as teachers. So thank you again. Thank you very much, and um, wonderful to see you all. And um, we have another career workshop uh, next Saturday, May 8th at 10.30 a.m. Um, and we're going to have four more alumni who are working in what we call public history, ACLU, Sotheby's archives, and um, the Los Angeles Public Library. So hope to see you then. Um, Jeff and, and um, Joanne and Edwin and Sergio, if you're interested, please join us or tell your students about it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so very much. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hey, Dr. Stroll. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Carol, for being here. <laughs>